Hey, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Nepomuk Nothelfer and I'm your host for the session 1.1, Players Management and Esports Education. I am myself, I'm a legal researcher and a founding member of the Esports Research Network. And I also founded the world's first research center uh, for esports law in Germany. And as an employment law specialist and a lecturer at various uh, national and international institutions, I am particularly looking forward to this session because for one thing, not every organization and professional esports kind of deserves the label professional. And for another, various academic programs have come under, let's say heavy criticism in recent years. So I'm really, really looking forward to um, this session. Unlike initially communicated, this session will only consist of three parts as Mr. Miller unfortunately cannot attend the conference at short notice. This is of course a pity, but it will not diminish the quality of the session as we were able to gather some of the most prominent and leading researchers on the current topics. So without further ado, I'd like to get straight uh, into the first communication titled Current Landscape of Higher Education Performance and Health-Related Esports Academic Programming. So I'd like to welcome, first of all, Assistant Professor at Slippery Rock University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Seth Jenny, Assistant Professor at Shenanunan, that's a tough one, Shenanandoah University in Winchester, Dr. Joey um, um, Goriasek, and Assistant Professor at University of Paris, Dr. Nicolas Bezombe. Take it away, guys. Thank you very much, Nipo. Seth, up to you. You are yeah. introducing? Okay. The, the problem with the international conference is trying to uh, know all these strange names uh, around <laughs> the world. So, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Seth Jenny. I uh, teach in the Department of Exercise and Rehabilitative Sciences at Slip Rock University in Pennsylvania in the U.S. Uh, I'm the faculty advisor of the esports club here. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> the deputy editor of the International Journal of Esports. And uh, a few other, I, I've been researching esports for, for quite some time now, and I'm really looking forward to uh, presenting with uh, Joey and Nico here. Yeah, um, thanks, Seth. Nipo, great job. Uh, the international conference is really tough to get these names right. Uh, my name is Dr. Joey Gariziak uh, at Shenandoah University in Virginia here in the States. Um, similar to, to Seth and everybody else, uh, I do some research in esports, but um, I'm also the director of our esports program here at Shenandoah on the competitive as well as the academic uh, and the professional development side of things with designing our arena, um, as well as the number of the academic programs and leading our competitive teams in competition. Uh, I also serve as a founder of the esports development and growth enterprise consulting group working on academics around the world. Uh, I'm also the chair of the board of directors for the National Association of Collegiate Esports here in the States, which is really right now about competition, although looking to offer a lot more for that. So a lot of my stuff is very practical. Uh, luckily, I'm here with Seth and Nico, so I can ride their, their research uh, coattails uh, because they are some of the best in the space. And so I'm really looking forward to this presentation and talking about some of the things that we have found together, especially on, on performance and health related esports programming. Uh, but Nico, I'll throw it to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Joey. Uh, you're flattering me. <laughs> and actually, uh, I'm Nicolas Bezombe, and I, uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Paris, at the sports faculty of the University of Paris. And beside that, I'm also the vice president of the French National Esports Association called France Esports. And I'm very, very pleased to have this opportunity to present you our work with this fantastic man uh, who are Joey and Seth. So here we go. All right, well, let's get started, Seth. And to get started, a, a brief introduction to what we've got here, because we have a lot of information to get through. But the impetus for everything that Seth and Nico and I have been looking at was that esports education was really thrust into the spotlight with the Esports Certificate Institute's Esports Professional Certificate. Well, wow, that's a mouthful. Uh, and that was met with a lot of backlash uh, because there was just not a lot of uh, need necessarily for having this esports professional certificate and people in the industry absolutely backlashed against it and said you don't need a certificate just by taking a test and passing something doesn't really qualify you for this so we thought it'd be good to look at the educational landscape for esports and what was out there around the world 
Uh, and the questions that really came up were, is there a need for a formalized esports education, esports degree, certificate, really program? And that's what we're getting into here is the type of programs that are out there. So really that's the background here is looking at, is there a need for it, especially in the face of this backlash that came out with that certificate? So actually what we observed during our actually uh, um, data collection or what we observe when we are looking at the, the esports industry is the fact that most of the esports pro now are um, the media are reporting a lot of esports pro that are retiring uh, prematurely due to health complications. I try since now one year and one year and a half with a lot of colleagues to collect all the you know uh, media news that are uh, um, giving us some um, some news regarding the, the the different players regarding different games that are retiring or that have who have problems with their health should should it be physical problems or physical issues or mental issues and this list that I, we are trying to uh, actually uh, collect uh, and to keep up to date uh, actually is not exhaustive right now. So as you can see, uh, players like Uzi for League of Legends or High for League of Legends, but also Flash in StarCraft 2 or Fear for Dota 2, these players at what time in their career had to stop to play and even to stop their career. So uh, on the physical side, what we have seen, it's mostly regarding, you know, wrist injuries, hand uh, pains, or actually uh, tendinopathies. And regarding mental uh, issues, it's mostly about burnout, exhaustion, uh, fatigue, lack of motivation, or mostly loss of motivation. So what we have observed too is that the fact that there is little is known regarding the amount of formalized esports health related academic programming in the world right now we don't really know actually what is done in all these certificates and programs and especially regarding health and performance related so the second point is the fact that we have little empirical evidence regarding this esports education. So, especially when we just target the uh, formal education of esports performance, health, and medicine in higher education. Right. And, uh, you know, you'll notice that this is going to be about health and performance related areas because this is part of a larger study that Seth and Nico recently had published in the International Journal of Esports which did an inventory on all the academic programs that we could find. And at that time, we were up to 95 worldwide higher ed esports programs. That since has changed, but this is kind of a part, a subsection of some of the findings from that study. So if you wanna check out that full study, make sure to go to the International Journal of Esports where you can find the entire larger study that has that complete analysis and inventory that was done and published earlier this year. I think the other thing, probably should have mentioned at the beginning of our talk is uh, we started collecting data on all of these programs back in 2018. And so it just recently has been published. Um, around that time, uh, Joey and I were, were uh, writing some of the initial early curriculum for Shenandoah's esports academic program there. And then I moved into uh, moving and creating curriculum at Slippery Rock, where we now have an esports minor, uh, which started this fall. And so we stopped data collection in March of 2021 and published uh, that previous study. And then since then in October, um, I, I published a, a short update, which had 20 more programs that were found. Um, and so now we're up to 115 academic higher education esports programs and those go across uh, undergraduate uh, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, diplomas, certificates, undergraduate minors. And uh, we have links to these um, full text articles that are all open access that we'll provide at the end as well. Uh, to finish kind of setting this up to talk about the purpose, and then I'll get to the methodology a little bit before going into the maps and the results that we have. 
The whole purpose of what we are talking about today is to provide an, al an analysis of the current global offerings of performance and health-related esports academic programs. Again, degrees, certificates, minors, they're called different things all over the world. <clears throat> we actually do get into, as you can see in the second part, the related modules or courses within each of these programs. So the whole idea is, is to provide that analysis and sort of that inventory of the specifics on esports performance, health, uh, and well-being. So that's really the, the main purpose of what we're going to get into today. And the way that we did this, um, collected this data, you can see here, Seth, of course, jumping the gun. Uh, you can see where, when the data was collected, July 2018 to March of 2021. So you're looking at a little more than two and a half years of research. And of course, as is true for all of esports, this is constantly changing. And there is more and more being developed at all times. So keep in mind the time frame of when we're collecting this data. Uh, for searching for this, we included e-sports, e-sport, uh, esports, you know, all different versions of esports that we could think of because different forms of esports are used all over the world. And we wanted to collect as many as we could. Now, we didn't include necessarily gaming or game design because that's a very different section that we didn't want to include in this inventory. This was esports specific as well as looking for degrees, diplomas, certificates, or minors when looking for, again, programs more so than just courses or modules, even though we break them down later. We were looking for those academic programs. <clears throat> so we did that through internet searches. We also solicited two Discord servers. Discord is a wonderful tool if used correctly. Uh, so we solicited two different servers there, the Esports Research Network, of course, as well as the Global Esports Studies uh, server to help find this information. <clears throat> uh, within this, we included the name, location, and the language taught uh, for each of these programs. And you can see all the different type of info that we also included uh, in that program. So <clears throat> it was things such as the title, type of program, year it started, the objectives, delivery format, program description, etc. As much information as we could find, we wanted to include in the results and the findings so that then we could triangulate this data and then pull themes from it. So we went to their websites, looked at media articles, and even relied on a lot of personal correspondence with our networks around the world to see what programs existed and then how we could classify them and provide that information for them. The last part is that we employed this comparative content analysis design and that we were looking across different programs uh, and different topics to see what was out there. And then we categorized, you know, we came up with themes and coded and we were able to come up with a couple of different areas, a few different areas, more than just a couple, where we could kind of clump these together. And that really helped us to draw some conclusions. A lot of frequency counts um, of the data with the type of program, the focus, the modules. So we looked across a number of different data points to make these descriptive statistics to really describe what is offered out there again, during that time frame up until March of 2021. So here are the results um, from our first analysis that uh, study that is published in the International Journal of Esports. I believe that is 45 pages long, the PDF file. So we thank Aaron Koshi for allowing us to um, publish the entire inventory. And that includes a, a ton of appendices that I encourage, if you're interested in this, we have web links, direct uh, links to all the programs that we found at the end. But across those in original 95 programs that we found, only uh, just under 13% focused on coaching, performance, or sports science. And then you can see the number of bachelor's degrees, technical degrees, certificates. So the majority of them were certificates and then undergraduate minors. And then from the additional 20 programs that were more recently found, you can see that we are up to uh, 22 programs and that bumped the percentage up to 19% of the 115 total uh, esports academic higher ed programs that focus on uh, coaching or performance. And so the term technical degree uh, in Canada, for example, the, that would be what would be like a diploma. 
Um, in the U.S., those are sort of like technical schools, like one to three year um, technical uh, degrees is what, what we would call them here. So four bachelor's degrees. Um, the most recent one is the University of Portsmouth in the U.K., uh, which is focused on uh, sports psychology and coaching. Right now, there are no found masters or, or PhD programs that focus on esports performance or coaching. Uh, undergrad certificates, you can see there's two. Grad certificates is one. And uh, Nico is the man with the maps. And so he'll go and t show you exactly where these are located, because I'm sure some of you are interested in that. But the majority of these programs, of these 22, they're focused on. Uh, Esports play. So, how to become better at playing um, whatever esport that, that that person plays. Uh, and that is sort of heavily tilted toward um, Japan, has uh, these technical degrees. I think there's eight or nine of them that are based in Japan all across the country. And so, that's really tilted toward, toward, toward the performance side of things. But no programs currently that we have found exclusively focus on esports health or esports medicine so yeah as self said i'm the guy from the maps <laughs> so <laughs> uh, what we have observed uh, is the fact that these different programs higher education programs are disseminated around the world in three specific geographical areas that are actually the three main geographic areas historically where we can find esports so it means mostly asia and, and east asia not really southeast asia but east asia then europe and then north america and especially us so all these so all these uh, different um, programs are concentrated in the north of the world. If we zoom in in the East Asia, we can see that most of these programs are mostly, as Seth said, disseminated in Japan. We, we found a lot of them in Japan. And one, which is one of the first one regarding all the programs that are existing uh, regarding any topics uh, of esports, in South Korea, in the Chennam Techno University. And what we can observe is the fact that all these programs in East Asia are technical degrees. So it's very specific. Um, actually, this is what we analyze. It's very specific to East Asia, technical degrees dedicated to play, to train the players, dedicated to performance, and maybe a little bit about health, but it's not that sure. Regarding Europe right now, as you can see, a lot are concentrated in Western Europe, so in France and in UK, based in UK, but also one in Finland at the Alman College, which is one of the first one actually in Europe. Not the first one because we know from our data that the first one dates back from the uh, late 20s and uh, late 2000s, sorry, um, uh, which was in Germany. But uh, in 2016, it was quite new for Europe to have uh, uh, an esports uh, uh, program dedicated, for actually a higher education program dedicated to esports. And as you can see, they are in France, in UK, bachelor degrees, so three years dedicated to esports, actually play, so playing esports, training in esports, but <clears throat> At the end of the second year, if the, the program see that the player can't actually attend the highest level, they propose him to integrate a bachelor for the, his third year, a bachelor in, for example, communication marketing or business administration dedicated to esports. And also, we have two programs that are one year certificates also in France that started in one city and not now that are spreading around France. Lastly, for North America, as you can see, it's mostly focused uh, on US and actually in the east of the United States with uh, different programs uh, and 
types of programs. So for the University of New Haven, it's a bachelor degree. Uh, for the Northern Illinois University, it's an undergraduate minor. And in Shenandoah and in the University of North Carolina, sorry, you find two undergraduate certificates and especially in North Carolina, also graduate certificates. So uh, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but we know that this video is gonna be on demand later. So we wanted to uh, put this inventory in the video so that you can Google these programs and find out more information. But here are the 12 uh, technical degree programs inventoried here. And you can see this is the name institution, uh, the location of where it is, and if it's not in English, what language is it taught in? Uh, the research that we found of when the program started, the year, which you can see Nico mentioned that South Korean program started uh, in 2007. Uh, what is the actual title of the program? What's the focus of it relating to health or performance? And then esports specific courses, when that was available, those are uh, when the curriculum was on the website, how many courses that um, were viewed as actually relating to specifically esports. Now, if we move into the bachelor's degree programs, uh, we have Chichester, um, New Haven. So here's the institutions here. Um, for bachelor's degrees, then the location of where that program is. So there's four, and actually, yeah. And then we have undergraduate certificates here. And graduate certificates, there's only one. One year certificates, there are two. And undergraduate minors, there is one currently. And you can see the focus areas for that. And lastly, uh, in the US, we call them courses. Outside of the US, they're called modules. So these are standalone individual modules that we came across that focused on performance or health. And uh, you can see here, um, this is the course that I'm teaching next semester. Uh, called Current Issues in Esports, Health, and Society. So these are individual modules that are offered uh, at a few different universities that aren't part of the programs previously shown. Uh, and, to, and to talk about those programs a little previously shown, when we initially did this study, that larger study, uh, there were 404 different modules uh, looked through, and 77 programs had the full curriculum available. Um, and you can notice on this chart where the coaching and performance and the medicine and health classes kind of were um, made a much smaller percentage than a lot of times the esports business, esports management, the intro classes, the esports. Uh, so the performance and coaching, 8% at the time, the medicine and health, about just over 1% of all courses or modules were based in that. The smaller arrows show where maybe there was some esports health or performance or medicine um, studying being done, but it, these courses weren't specific to a certain area of esports because they were internships, practicums, current issues courses, or research kind of courses. So maybe they had some health related areas in there, maybe they didn't. It was hard to gather that data based on what we found. But you can see this makes up a very, very small percentage based on those initial results. Uh, and something kind of, I don't know, timely, something kind of interesting that came out of this study, the results here was that the University of Chichester is taking this to another level and that we found that they are offering uh, three full-time research positions, almost research scholarships, for students to come there and study within the sport and physical activity area, but really about esports performance and mental health around uh, esports players. So they've taken it to that level that they are actually searching for researchers in this area to go to the University of Chichester to keep doing this research on this scholarship kind of basis. So these kind of opportunities are becoming more and more available as we see more programs develop with this need for more research in the area. And be before we go to the next slide, I do wanna acknowledge looking at the degree programs in the map, um, we did accidentally omit, um, we, we listed Chichester twice when <laughs> University of Portsmouth 
uh, should have been on that map as well with uh, coaching and performance. So uh, full disclosure, I'll take the blame on that. But um, University of Portsmouth in the UK is is another new program for performance uh, psychology and, and coaching, in addition to Chichester here with the PhD programs. So the implication for of this study is, of course, what we think, and is the fact that educating esports practitioners and esports players on the health management of players, of course, is the paramount for the sustainability for the esports ecosystem. Why is that? Because when we are speaking about sustainability of this esports ecosystem, we of course are thinking about lengthening the professional player careers. The, it's a real challenge. If you want to have, uh, you know, a rejuvenation of the esports professional ecosystem, we need actually to create the, the, the best environment to, uh, for the amateur and grassroots players. And we need to have educators that are actually dedicated to health or to prevent health issues uh, for the players. So developing esports specific health actually promotion knowledge, skills and abilities among future esports professionals. And when we are speaking about professionals, it's mostly coaches, staffs, you know, could contribute, of course, to lengthening these professional player carries and increase the health of the players at all the levels. So what we think, and this is our manifesto, is the, the fact that formal education may be part of this solution. So in summary, uh, what we did is we provided an inventory of what's currently being offered relating to health and performance in higher ed across the world. Uh, we offered a, a, a short analysis of those programs uh, and we realized, and hopefully through the data, you've seen that there certainly is a lack of formalized education relating to uh, esports health in higher education. Uh, that focuses more toward performance when it comes to, to, to health and performance. And lastly, we don't know what is currently being taught in um, a lot of these esports health related modules, those individual courses. And we also don't know who is teaching it. And we have a, a lot of other further lingering questions that Joey's going to talk about here. <laughs> There's always lingering questions. Um, <laughs> call this lingering questions, call this further research, call this a call to action. You know, this could this can take on a lot of different names, but it's hard to get all the information um, about all these programs internationally. And some of the other things we came up with, um, are there, what are the jobs out there? Would they be able to acquire jobs? Should this be a separate field from esports health or a subsection? Um, who, like Seth said, who is teaching it? Is it embedded in sports medicine programs? Uh, so all those are yet to be answered. And uh, like I said, more and more programs coming, but these are the things we'll focus on going forward. So our two main, um, the original study is this update on higher, or, or I'm sorry, the esports.edu. This was the 95 programs. I encourage you to check that out. And then the update with the 20 additional programs is this uh, citation right here. So here's our references and... Uh, we're ready for questions. Awesome. Sorry, doc sorry, Dr. Matthew Watson for omitting Portsmouth. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for your uh, great insight, guys. Um, we've got three questions. I feel like the first two of them are, you already answered them, but maybe you could uh, clarify. The first one would be, those schools seem to be focused on player education. Are there uh, some academic um, different like 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 schools for 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 the staff uh, management wise uh, i feel like you already answered that but maybe you want to clarify real quick so in our original study where we inventoried the 95 programs 80 percent of the academic programs were focused on esports business or management or or some uh, type of a business related esports um program so that that's uh, yeah, I think that answers the question. The majority of those yeah. programs. So then there was um, about a small minority also were, were focused on esports communication and, and broadcasting, um, and then um, yeah, about thirteen percent were focused on health and performance. Great, thanks. Um, I'll just get to next questions because we're in a hurry. Um, 
The another question would be how can a master's degree in sport uh, psychology or exercise and sport uh, psychology compare to esport coaching slash uh, psychology like the one from Chichester? Chichester. Wow. <laughs> You want me to take that? Um, so uh, honestly, I think you, it would depend on the program and the best people to ask would be to contact the program director for that uh, master's degree and ask them that question. Because uh, what we came across in our analysis was what we called um, e-sportifying curriculum, where there are some programs that seem to be um, genuine and they're looking at uh helping students acquire the knowledge and skills to work in the esports industry there seems to be other programs that take an existing program like a sports management degree add an intro to esports class to it and now boom we've got an uh, an esports degree and so they re re um, packaged and rebranded what they currently were having to try to acquire new students and it's in what we appear is as a type of predatory practice um, and so you need to look into what is in the curriculum, who's teaching the curriculum, um, are there internship and experiential learning experiences within it, just like whenever any other type of, of program, um, don't rely on uh, what things are said on the, on the website, you need to investigate. Um, yeah, it just depends on the individual program. Perfect. Great. And then we'll finish with one last question. Um, pretty interesting, in my opinion. Is there any idea how much training performance programs are linked to traditional sport programs in schools or universities? And maybe you can um, talk about like where it's implemented well and not like those predator, predator uh, like we we'll just need new students um, we don't really care about um, what we're teaching methods i can uh, give some uh, uh, some data about that for our data actually we don't have a lot of data but it's the fact that when we actually uh, first try to collect all the different programs it was one of the the different indicators that we try to collect actually in which department of the university actually these esports programs were linked? Is it to the sports faculty, to the communication department? You know, uh, and what we have seen it the fact that, as you can see, there are a, a lack uh, sometimes in our different indicators because um, there is a, also a lack of transparency regarding uh, most of these programs. The, their websites are not totally transparent. We don't have all this data. So we know that there are some uh, of these programs that are totally linked to sports sciences, sports studies, but we don't have the data for all these programs. Maybe Seth and Joy, you want to add some stuff? There aren't a lot of programs that focus on uh, pro gaming uh, in the US. So you would have the best insight um, but Joey has done several international trips with his students to programs, so he might have some additional insight, though. Um, I, I don't have a lot more insight, and I was actually answering some questions on, on YouTube as well, trying to type some information in. But no, I think Nico absolutely covered it. Um, it, it. I think there's a lot of more need for further research in those questions yet to be answered. The more international trips we have, more collaborations we can do, it's, it's going to help us out. Amazing. So I'll guess uh, we will have, we're in your debt because uh, what you're doing is pretty, pretty uh, amazing. And it's, it's really necessary because there are some universities out there um, that are not trying to develop a, a healthy ecosystem in esports, uh, but to, to gain from it in, in, in different ways. So thank you so much. And with that, we will switch to the next presentation from amateur to professional a brief review of esports game companionship in China by Shen Yingrong. So uh, Leslie, great to have you with us. Leslie is working for Flex in Mobile as an IT and communication system technician and analyst in mobile game delivery. And even better, right now currently, she's the number one power league player in Hungary, which is pretty awesome. Um, but even more awesome, of course, is that you will try to help us gain an understanding on game companionship in China. 
And as probably every every Western esports researcher will know, it's quite hard to get good insights into the Asian side of esports, um, especially in relation to the big esports nation of China. Um, and that's not only because of the language, but because of the culture as a whole. So I am really, really looking forward to your presentation, Leslie. Take it away. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Test. Hello. Okay, good. Um, so uh, without further ado, because uh, we run out of time. So uh, today I'm going to talk about something special um, in probably only existed in Chinese market called Game Companion. You can talk with them, uh, communicate them, uh, communicate with them while playing games with them. And practice companions, uh, they are focusing more on the technical side, so they help you to improve your skills by practicing playing games with you. Uh, but you know nowadays that these two terms are mixedly used in Chinese media. So when we say uh, play companions, it doesn't mean they are very bad at playing games. When we say practice companions, it doesn't mean they are pros or esports players. So I think. Uh, you know, to cover both of the functions, so we can actually come out one word which is called a game companion to so cover both the roles and responsibilities, uh, which indicates the kind of job that um, provide a social interactive process in game playing while it will help you to improve your game skills. And uh, there are three types of uh, game companions. The foremost and also the earliest model comes from the esports live websites uh, like YY. So uh, this type of uh, game companions are uh, quite competitive because they have to go through a lot of competitions uh, in order to be selected as a game companions work for the channel under the this esports live websites. And they will be offered uh, with a full-time uh, contract and that's why you seldom see them do anything tricky other than playing games with you. Of course, they also charge more because, you know, they are professional. Uh, but when we talk about game companions nowadays, the most common uh, model will be app and studio based game companions. Uh, so this kind of job entry level is very low. Uh, instead of playing games well, you can also have a nice face or you just have a nice voice. It can potentially make you a very good game companion uh, on these apps or you know in studios. So that's because that uh, this kind of game companionship services is expanded there business map so fast, which we will mention later, uh, that they change the game companionship into from something which is only game centered to a more um, social media types of function. Uh, but you know, we will talk this more. Um, it's not from 2014, there's uh, different types of game companion called the net bar game companions. So if you are uh, aware of the existence of uh, cafe made in Japan, uh, this type of girls wearing either very sexy clothes or a uh, Lolita type of style, when you are playing games in that bar, they're just sitting next to you and provide you with coffee and drinks. Um, you know, this type of game companions, of course, they brought a lot of income uh, to to the Nepal, but then they also receive uh, a lot of criticisms from the Chinese society because the public tends to have less tolerance towards uh, them, this type of game companions. So that's why, because of the controversies, uh, uh, nowadays you seldom see them on the street. And previously we say that the app and studio based game companions, they do a lot of things other than playing games with you. 
So this includes that they probably can provide you with psychological consultation. Uh, if you have BAMU, you want somebody to talk to, you can find somebody on these apps, uh, you know, just share your secrets with them. They also have uh, uh, streamers and net celebrities who do live radios or organizing chatting rooms in for you to know people from other gender. And then also you can update your status uh, on microbook blogging systems on the website. So it's like I said, that this type of game companionship services is moving themselves from something uh, highly game related to a social media platform. Um, but still in this presentation, I would say that game companionships in, to uh, avoid the future confusions, uh, game companions are a uh, type of people who provide the game related services and to enhance your game experience by satisfy your social interaction needs in the games or uh, they just help you with your skills in the games as well. Anyway, so uh, pretty quickly move to the industry and let's start with uh, uh, why game companionship exists in China, appeared in China. And uh, you know that there are multiple ways for you to improve your skills. So first one, of course, that everybody does, it, uh, does is to uh, watch videos, watch esports uh, live videos, uh, watch how play pros play games. It kind of alters people's understandings about the games and change it their thinkings when they meet the similar kinds of difficulties. So uh, we have a lot of researchers uh, talking about how streaming videos uh, can have impacts not only on the esports, how esports and net celebrities were built, and also how people understand games. But you know, just here we don't mention them. Um, but you know that uh, in China, the special thing comes from here is that uh, you know because we build a bridge between the pros and the noobs and the noobs wants to be better players. And then what can they do? Except the learning from the videos in China, we come up with a, a different kinds of model, which is uh, gold farming. Uh, it's not something that we are proud of, but uh, it just existed. It comes from the you know popularity of these esports players. And as a matter of fact, there are multiple sources saying that the Chinese esports players, and they are, you know, sooner or later, they will be involved with gold farming. And go for me, it's a very quick way for uh, new players, uh, players who are bad at their games uh, to achieve goals and uh, get a lot of rewards from the games. But nowadays they are prohibited by many uh, game companies. Uh, I know in Korea, they also have regulations that ban people from using go farming. So what, what can we do? What the market can do to provide a better kind of learning experience for uh, Chinese players. That's where game companionship uh, came into the place because a game companionship not only provide you chances to communicate with the pros, but uh, they sort of were giving you a kind of interactive learning process. You can play with them, uh, learning with them by see how they conquer the difficulties and how they deal with the situation in real games. Um, so previously, we say that the, the developments of game companionship uh, is highly related to uh, esports uh, developments in China, also the popularity of esports uh, in general. And nowadays, the game companionship is developed so fast that it became, uh, it became a vertical industry uh, in China uh, in esports. And before 2013, like I previously mentioned, uh, why why? Uh, channel was uh, sorted as the earliest model of game companionship. But start from 2013 to 2017, it's kind of exploring time that people explore different kinds of business models in game companionships. That's why you see uh, like app-based uh, game companionship or uh, Nepal game companionship started to appear. And since 2018, IG win winning uh, words 2018. I know Europeans don't like that, um, but you know, esports industry started to, to uh, have this booming area, uh, booming time, booming era in China, and a lot of policies are supporting the developments of esports related industry. And game companionship also caught the uh, chances. And in 2018, there was a statistic saying that the uh, uh, thousands of game companionship studios and apps and websites. Uh, were built. Of course, most of them, uh, you know, just disappear in the end. But still, you see the um, people's passion of having game companionship uh, business rather than opening Chinese restaurants. Uh, this year, that uh, there's a new policy uh, which suspended the, the major players in this industry for providing game companionship 
uh, services. The it's very it just came out of sudden, but you know the reasons we will be explained in the very end of the presentation. And you know that uh, in in esports industry, game companionships are just one of them. And how to bring the uh, best out of everybody, pro players, live platforms, short video based media, uh, uh, so, sorry, short media based uh, social platforms or uh, game companies, how to bring the best out of everybody. I think that everybody has to co collaborate with everybody. And that's why I think that the game companionships developments also brought a lot of business opportunities for uh, other, other branches in the esports industry. For example, like uh, pro players, for retired pro players, they can become game companions because they have a very good reputation. So they also charge more compared with other game companions. And also game companions provide a large group of users for the professional esports team uh, to choose future esports star as well. I think that's uh, what Beijing, uh, the largest uh, game companionship service provider is doing right now. Um, for uh, live platforms and TikToks, uh, Beijing also chose uh, uh, some future potentials of like net uh, celebrities, KOLs, or uh, streamers and train them into you know, somebody who is famous. Um, and the kind of advertisement effects brought by these successful cases would be huge. And for game companies like Beijing also signed up with some game companies in, uh, to hire some famous uh, game companions on the website to, to play with the randoms. Of course, their game, play their games with the randoms. It brought a better kinds of advertisement effects uh, compared with, you know, just game company putting the ads on Google. And how this uh, game companionship website makes money. Most of the game companionship uh, websites make money uh, through commission, like taking certain percentage uh, of the game companion's income. But there are two special cases. One is uh, Baoji Esports. So Baoji Esports, they don't take any commission, uh, but they require to pay certain amount of uh, deposit before you start to take jobs as a, a game companion on the website. And then the second one, second one is the Lao Yue Go, which they don't take anything. Uh, they don't take commissions. They don't take a, a deposit either. Um, it will be very interesting question uh, if we have time to discuss later is how these websites uh, ensure the stickiness of uh, you know the game companions because uh, for these uh, apps they are just one of the platforms to connect the pros with the uh, players. And in the end, uh, the pros and players will move their communication to. Uh, some social media platform which they are more familiar with, like uh, uh, Weibo, WeChat. So how to be sure that these game companions will still use these websites instead of moving their conversations to other other sorts of social media in order to pay less of commissions and make more? That would be something very interesting to discuss later, if we have time, of course. Um, Generally speaking, that game companionship is something very profitable. Uh, it can generate 300,000 Chinese yuan to 3 million uh, Chinese yuan per month. It's not per year, it's, it's per month. Uh, but it really depends on the, uh, you know, the business management and how people run their pretty much just business, business management kind of issue. But here I take a, a data from Watch PM, uh, which is like the medium level of income for the game companionship uh, apps, like uh, five, 500,000 Chinese yuan income per month. And you, you see that deducting the expenses, including marketing, uh, human, uh, you know, human resources and things like that, they can still Manage to make a 290, which is more than half of the income as a profit. So you can see that it's a very profitable. That's why so many people are doing similar kinds of game companionship services. And uh, among all the players, Beijing is the biggest one. I, I pretty 
pretty much mentioned them earlier in the presentation. Uh, Beijing provided many job opportunities for people who, live, especially live in the countryside during the COVID time, when everybody is losing their jobs, Beijing uh, providing such good job opportunities for people, especially full-time game companions, to have the kind of income that can compete with other sorts of jobs in China. So it's pretty good. The 7,900, even in Beijing and Shanghai, I think it's a very competitive salary. And they're also going abroad. So if there are Chinese community around you, you will see that there's a potential uh, chances to become a game companion. And that's why we see that Beijing already is blowing their maps to uh, US, to Canada, to Australia, to Europe as well. And what kind of people are using a uh, game companionship service? I think here, all the data are related to Bixin. So only one, one app instead of multiple apps. Uh, so Bixin, uh, Bixin's more primary users are coming from coastal provinces because these places are with a better uh, economical situation, I think, because people there make more, so they have higher pursuit of having a uh, good game experience. If you want to have a good game experience, then you have to pay more for a better game companion. That's something it's very easy to understand. Uh, here we see that uh, Hunan and Hubei, they are actually not coastal provinces, but they are very close to Zhejiang province and Fujian province. Both of them are uh, coastal provinces as well, and they here they rank as six and seven. So I would say coastal provinces are still, in, still taking the lead. And the primary user group uh, in Beijing are um, male who are under 30, so young men. <laughs> so uh, young men, because they are, uh, they pay more attention to, to games, the achievements they have in games or the kind of friends that they have in games. Uh, also because of that, Beijing provided chances for them to hang out with girls and you know, have potential dates. And uh, there's a rough user profiling uh, done by iResearch saying that the uh, uh, users uh, below 25 are mostly playing, paying for games. Uh, people from 25 to 35, they pay for games or you know, potential dates. And about 35, you're no longer paying attention to games. So you just want somebody to talk to as a companion. But I think it really differs. This very rough data cannot explain many you know, details because like if we talk about the ratio like three to one as a uh, male users to female users on Bixin, you have to consider about uh, what kind of games we are talking about. Some of the games which requires skills and tactics, female players tend to more tend to be more likely to pay for a, a game companionship in order to help them to improve in games. So we see here all three games require certain types of types of skills and tactics, uh, something that female players usually lack of. And uh, we also see that there is a difference uh, of the time when it's more, more likely for male or female players to pay for game companionship. You see from data, you will feel like, oh, uh, male players like to pay for game companionship at night. That means they are, uh, you know, they are just looking for a girl. <laughs> but it's uh, actually not the case because we have to see that from a, a more broader data. Previously in the slide, I mentioned that two millions of Beijing game companies and make money through the websites, while 2. Uh, 2. sorry, 1.29 million of them made money through uh, sharing game skills. So, so in the end, the game companionship website should take the responsibility uh, of sharing game skills, uh, providing a better platform for the pros and noobs to communicate with each other. So games uh, should be the uh, business focus rather than other types of services. And in the end, so um, you probably will ask why this industry is so creative, so beneficial and great industry. Why is it suddenly suspended by the government? I think it's not something, uh, you know, just come out of a sudden because the general public doesn't really like the industry. Uh, even though a lot of people made money through it, but the investors, the companions, and also the government, uh, here, Xinhua is a government news agency. They don't like game companionships atmosphere, like the kind of environment that they uh, provided to the players. 
Why? Because uh, mostly because of that uh, so many female game companions, they are um, not providing game related services. So they just take off their clothes in order to uh, attract uh, male players. So uh, sexual content is something that's highly pro prohibited in China. So it's not a surprise that the government wants to take it down. Also because the uh, government, you know, there are some policies uh, just issued recently to um, kind of prevent the uh, teenagers of getting addicted to games. Uh, so I would say that Chinese government's attitude towards the game industry is all, always very contradicting with each other. So it's not a surprise that they suddenly take this move of saying, okay, game companionship has to stop at some point. Uh, but even that, even without that, I would say that in the industry, there are many problems. For, for example, previously I mentioned that the uh, game companionship so on apps and studios, they are expanding their business map so fast that they are not doing something game related. So it makes the customers needs of finding a, a pro uh, very difficult to achieve nowadays. Also because there are so many game uh, female game companions, they are actually doing sexually related uh, things. So it deepened the kind of sexual discriminations in esports circle from male to female, I think sort of. And last but not least, I also want to mention that, you know, for Chinese government, the game industry is something that few, you know, they always have few years, a few years ago, they encouraged the development of the industry, but a few years later, they have to put a stop on everything. So they are kind of, you know, feeling feeling not like uh, something, games are something good for the society. So they sometimes they encourage you, sometimes they stop, it depends on the economic uh, effects abroad to the society. So I think a game companionship service as something game related should always be prepared that there is a point that the government will say no to them. But I just didn't see that coming so fast, actually just right after I submit the abstract. But what will happen in the future? I don't know, I think we will just to have to wait and see. Uh, so that's it. I hope I didn't you know, overly use time. And um, if you have any questions or want to challenge me on Browse SaaS, please contact me on uh, Discord. Or you have any questions regarding Chinese game industry overall. Uh, so thanks so much. And I'm ready to take some questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. You actually did amazing. Uh, so amazing that you saved this time schedule. So um, more than well done. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, we have one question right now. Um, is it already possible to observe that like very large companies in China, the likes of Weibo, for example, uh, are entering such services? And if so, what can small companies which are already in the space do to survive um, against those big players? Uh, I think uh, so, so far, uh, because of game companionship, now it's put on suspension. So uh, from the previous three years of developments, um, um, major players are either, you know, like from eSports live websites, like I previously said, or uh, like Beijing is de developed, uh, you know, from the offline net bars. <laughs> so I, I think uh, it's not, uh, industry like we imagined that, that uh, major players like for example Tencent or NetEase who have the sources of games to dominate the market. Um, for I, I see a lot of I see a lot of uh, like uh, uh, reports regarding individuals opening uh, game companionship websites. Also, I see a lot of big companies getting uh, you know ten millions, twenty millions of. Um, investments tend, tend out to be bankrupt. So I think it's really depends on the uh, business management, uh, the kind of path that you choose. Some big companies, uh, they prefer to put more money on, uh, you know, like creating some new ways of game companionship. And these companies, unfortunately, uh, died in the end, except the uh, Bixin. So um, to answer your question, I think it's, First, I would say that it's not a kind of industry that we imagine that major players come into, like major game producers come into the place and then take everybody's uh, 
cake. It's not like that. It's everybody starts from zero. Uh, so there's uh, no su such of a monopoly in game companionship industry. Uh, that's the first thing. Second is uh, it really depends on the um, business management, the kind of paths that you choose, uh, how you manage all the in investments and all the funding you have from the investors. And uh, people can success with only you know, 30,000 Chinese yuan or they just die in, because of, you know, they cannot manage, manage 10 million of Chinese yuan. So it really depends. I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I am muted. muted. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> it, it had <laughs> to happen. It just had to happen, right? <laughs> No, uh, thanks so much uh, for your insights. Uh, as, as you already said, it's so interesting when we talk about uh, China and the, yeah, I don't want to call it video game ban, but, but uh, where's China going to go in the next year? So, and so, so thank you so much uh, for your insights. Um, I do not see any more questions right now. Oh, there, there is actually one more question. I, I will just We'll just uh, take this if it's okay for you. Um, what do you think is the biggest difference between esports in China and esports in US or Europe? Like in the US, esports is shaped by American specific models of sporting consumption. Um, could you could you enlighten us there? What 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 is like? What do you think is the biggest difference? Uh, I think that the, you know there are so many things to talk about uh, from the policies to the industry to the actual players. But you know I just uh, quickly talk something so we can save time. Uh, I, I think that the first is you have to acknowledge that esports industry developed in China in a such a curved way. It's not a smooth way because the government doesn't really support the industry at the first place. Uh, the encouragement of esports uh, industry's policies existed only after uh, 2010, if you study the policies. And uh, previously, that Chinese, uh, Chinese public, also the Chinese government, are struggling to regulate the games as something that fits into the uh, socialism, so called socialism uh, requirements. So even in 2005, we have like W. E. Sky, who is a very, very famous esports player uh, winning the game doesn't mean that the government will uh, you know approve the whole industry to develop so um, when 2018 IG winning the game everybody's feeling like oh my god uh, more than more than like more than 15 years of struggling the government doesn't support the, the uh, public taking uh, esports as a symptom of a game addiction uh, older generation doesn't like the esports at all uh, young people finally find its place to speak out loud to the to the society that the esports can be a sport it can be something that's uh, earning the glory to the nation so i think that uh i don't see this kind of you know struggling this kind of big struggling in uh in europe and us i think that's the most major uh problem in china now even nowadays when we say esports players we tend to consider them as not as you know people doing uh, good jobs they are just because they cannot do anything else so they play games so you see that the, the social status of esports players they are still not very, very high. And it's something that esports players are uh, feeling struggling um, about. And it, this kind of situation seems to be not existed uh, so much, at least so much in the uh, US and Europe. That's why I say that the, generally speaking, the development of the Chinese esports industry is um, uh, it's so difficult. It's still going upwards, sometimes going downwards, and we are catching up the US and Europe, but it's gonna take a very long time. Awesome. Now I managed to unmute myself. Great. Thanks so much for your insights. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Um, and with that, I'll guess we will head over to our third and last but not least part, um, rationale and perspective of the eSports Health and Performance Network. And I will be joined by Professor Dr. Claudio Nick uh, from the Institute of Sports Science at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And um, he will present a study with a lot of colleagues actually, and we're really, really interested in the showings of this study. So are you ready? Well, I think I am. Perfect. Um, now let's see, are we on the title slide? 
and that is noticeable, the switch of slides. Yeah, it works. Great, excellent. Um, I'm uh, presenting on behalf of a group. Uh, it's actually not uh, a study at this point, uh, uh, but we're looking at uh, developing a network. Uh, well, well, we are developing a network with, a, with colleagues from game design, uh, from uh, the sports sciences, and physiology along with uh, uh, along with other partners. And uh, I, I really want to take a little bit of a uh, kind of a detour and say the first two presentations actually set up the need for uh, the ERN network, which we are part of uh, in this conference. And I hope to convince you that the E-Shape network has a complementary role to play. And uh, we see uh, the, there is lack of standardization in the education system um, in this young field. Um, is, it, is it sports science? Is it health science? Uh, is it a, a certificate? Is it a bachelor or master's degree? Or even can we do PhDs in it? Uh, and I think what uh, Chen has nicely represented that within countries uh, and across countries, there are challenges in uh, how the industry is shaping itself. So let me have, uh, let me uh, get, see whether I can actually move the fly forward. Um, I don't need to talk to a lot about this. Um, we're here because esports is a big, big issue. Over the last decade, you can see the Frequent viewers and enthusiasts of esports has more than uh, multiplied by five. And we see that on the growth side, on the uh, economic growth side, uh, we're also, this is just the last, since 2019 and estimated to 2024. So over a five year period, you can see that it, uh, it's uh, from, just under a billion to 1.6 billion. Um, it's a good time to be involved. It is also a very um, changing market, changing educational um, effort and different themes come up. And we think that this gives us a lot of opportunity. But I think we've already talked about the, the uh, the first presentation talked about the predatory degrees and, uh, and uh, the second presentation referenced now that uh, stuff is actually being stopped. Um, Esports does come with some negative stereotypes, uh, which we will uh, need to look at. Uh, parts of societies don't accept esports, um, so there's social exclusion problems. There's also a stigma and uh, it's whether or not it's true or not, I suggest that you watch the session 2.3 later on today, uh, where, where we actually see whether or not an esport player is really that unhealthy, but the stigma is there. So this stigma uh, does Pro potentially shy away some investors and potential uh, partners, which could, which could really strengthen our, our network. Um, I'm actually a health psychologist, uh, a behavioral medicine researcher. So I uh, look at uh, uh, motivating people to be physically active and do other healthy behaviors. When we uh, look at some of the studies that have come out of late, uh, it has linked uh, the esports to increased stress, sleep disturbances, sedentary behavior, a lot of sitting, uh, obesity, and behavioral problems. Um, those are to be really considered because those are all risk factors for high risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and other uh, non communicable diseases. Um, so, what we need to be considering here is, um, is this an opportunity to really shape the culture of the eSport? 
when we compare esport uh, versus traditional sport, I'm not going to go into a, uh, the debate about sport itself, but I'm looking more at structures. Um, in sports, you have a physical health and safety network. Uh, you have specific training programs. You have health professional and uh, health professional associations for the sports. Um, there are, for example, clearances for, for physical health and return to play protocols. That to me, I think, uh, shows the still um, young level of this field. And when we think about it, this really needs to be part of a larger infrastructure developing process that we can uh, standardize structures and then we can also include trainings. Uh, I know Germany has just created a, a training manual and training handbook for esports tr uh, training. So some of these things are starting to get, uh, get rolling. Um, I see uh, well, our, our group sees a lot of potential here. And uh, as an example, I, I just said new training tool, new train, training tools, healthy warmups, regeneration, um, you know, training for 10 hours a day. Um, even the uh, even professional athletes take breaks and regenerate. So in as much as uh, we see the esports athletes requiring the same kind of um, recovery to increase performance. Physical activity and health promotion through gaming technology. Um, uh, what uh, one of our partners, uh, the Sperry Group, uh, has an extra, extra cube. Uh, so it could be that these extra games are part of the training. Um, when we look at uh, adapting existing sports technology to the e-health market, integrating virtual reality, augmented reality games by requiring physical activity and e in e-health services. Wouldn't it have been really interesting had Pokemon Go worked with the health insurance companies? Because it increased uh, research we've done with Pokemon Go. It increases physical activity and it decreases sedentary behavior. Playing the game itself. So it's the game that actually would uh, promote the healthy behavior. There's also potential to transfer uh, in transferring the sports tech market into esports, uh, certainly uh, transferring uh, what works in some other sports. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of application opportunities uh, within the esports field, and focusing specifically on uh, on the health side of things, you can see that uh, esports because it's so young and because it's forming and then uh, oh what is it uh, uh, for forming, norming, no, storming, norming, storming, forming, norming, and performing. That's how it works. And what we have here is within the digital technologies, um, working actually with what esports individuals are good at, there is a lot of health related things. So integrating those, integrating the physiology apps into the esports. Very interesting um, thoughts. Movement-based movement, movement -based games, uh, those are the extra games. Uh, I, I really think that uh, that can have an excellent home within the esports community. In addition to it being a esport itself. So you can have tournaments uh, with um, some of these uh, extra games. The media ecosystem, we've seen some of the reach um, that the sports has, and we look at a social phenomenon that is, for, that is happening right now in the last few years. And the esports players and the reach of the esports organizations is something that a scientist would love, 
love can only dream of and i think what we what if we can combine the research and the practice i think the the amount of practical uh, moving forward and the knowledge to be gained is uh, is immense uh, finally uh, of course uh, thinking about professionalizations um, we need to make sure that these job categories that are coming up in and around the esport world is of course socially relevant but also economically and culturally re relevant so let me uh, ask you right now to take a quick break and to work with me on a little activity here because you've all been sitting for the last hour and uh, 20 minutes and I'm a health psychologist. So I wanna motivate everybody to just do a little quick activity. So with your right hands, um, point your finger and the thumb together. It's an excellent presentation so far. I agree, it's unanimous. Everybody's doing the same thing. But uh, now go to the middle finger and now go to the ring finger and now the little one and back to the pointy middle ring little pointy middle yeah you guys know this you guys are well uh, how about left-handed well talented in this. This, this this is an easy easy exercise for esports individuals pointy middle ring little pointy middle ring okay can we do it with both hands pointy middle ring little pointy middle. okay now we have a little thing called sparking it up let's spark it up okay on the right hand I would like to have you with the pointy finger on your thumb, on the left hand with your middle finger, okay? And move forward one. And move forward one. And forward another one. And 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 another one. <laughs> Excellent. Great job. So we've just done a fine motor physical activity and it is also a cognitive activity. Um, great if you're talking to groups and you're trying to get attention because right now when you did that skill, uh, that activity, it's extremely tough to check your email or to do something else or to multitask. So you're focusing back to the task at hand. But it's a great little trick to do because it actually helps when you're gaming to get your brain restarted and get your focus refocused. So um, what I've just done with that little example, I've just made my point in terms of research and practice. I've just done a quick uh, physical activity break, which is proven in the research world as good for the health and to decrease the long-term sitting. If we promote health, we're going to increase work productivity and decrease healthcare costs. That's from our world. Well, productivity, healthcare costs, that's something that I believe the esports group or the esports culture would also be interested. Additionally, when we look through life, lifetime development, looking at developing cognition uh, and fundamental movement skills through esports, extra games and long-term physical activity is something that we wanna do because that will improve the quality of life across the lifespan. So esports and extra games um, can actually be thought of as another way of getting physical activity. The other side is on the performance side. Uh, I think uh, really excited uh, on, on what can we learn from the elite esports players? Innovation here can be a motivator in performance and health across other areas. So esports can actually inform other, er other, other sporting areas and other achievement areas. So essentially, uh, maybe we should help inspire the esports athletes for esports fitness. And esports fitness, of course, would include health and uh, cognitive and, and movement skills. So uh, to get to the point here, 
we actually see esports as a role model for tackling critical public health issues. So to, with that uh, long and drawn out rationale, uh, we came to uh, develop the eShape network um, this year. Um, and really our, our thoughts are to be part of shaping the eSport phenomenon through multidisciplinary participatory network. Um, what are the values of businesses? What are the values of government agencies? What are the values of players and player organizations? And what are the values of uh, research and other stakeholders? And really to foster this cross-sectoral interchange to promote esports players' health and performance. And I think I want to add to that the esports fans health because the esports players have a great in to the fans so here's what uh, we've been thinking about when we look at the e-shape network um, i'm not going to go into a great detail but you can see how different um, uh, areas of esports is represented from society to industry, coupled with research. And really we're interested in structures, services, such as trainer education, technologies, um, strategies, prevention, intervention. On that side, there's also technology. In order to sensitize, increase the value of esports and promote health along as a nice side effect of things. This actually would be then uh, the main outcome is societal impact and benefit. So this is a multidisciplinary community participatory network, as I've already said, it's really unique to frame this uh, phenomenon, connect the stakeholders and look at um, having conversations that even on uh, in universities is, is maybe not not going on. Um, we are we are very interested in connecting research and practice, uh, developing specific strategies with stakeholders to translate the research and practice. So in that sense, I think we're a nice uh, a nice uh, partner and uh, to the ERN. Um, we also think that working on the societal meaning and esports acceptance in order to have greater credibility in the polit politics and in industry. So this really allows us to make esports an exemplar for sustainable and health oriented development within society. It's no small task, but I think it's going to be a great adventure and I think the motivation uh, is there among many different sectors. So thank you very much for your time and uh, allowing me to present our E-shaped network. And remember, physical activity, take the pill daily. It's not as easy as, a, not as, easy as a pill, but um, stay, stay active. Awesome. Dear Claudia, of course, not a study, but a network. So sorry for the mistake of mine earlier. Um, thanks so much for your great presentation and the fun little exercise um, that had me sweating more than I would have hoped. <laughs> um, so um, first of all, best of luck to you and um, Dr. Annalisa Martin-Niedecken, Professor Dr. Mirko Schmidt, Claudia Kubica, Patrick Zimmermann, Alex Brutmann and um, Dr. Sascha Kettelhut and everyone else who is involved. Um, I will ask, I will start with a question of mine first, because I'm absolutely thrilled about this project, because at this point of time, a great deal of research, at least in my opinion, represents only the admittedly largest part of eSports, but only the, the part of eSports sitting at the PC or a console. But it's not only, but it's of course not the only way to compete as you showed using computer games, talking about VR, AR, or in general XR. So. In my papers, I always try to differentiate here, which results in publications that are three times as long um, as I thought they would be. Um, so my question would be, 
how would you assess that? How much of the research on esports you, um, all of you read, um, do not actually accurately distinguish there and maybe as a follow-up there, make the, the, uh, the publication, the research not as useful as it could be. <laughs> so yeah. without throwing shade here. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, and you know, that is always with a young field. Um, the, the first uh, parts of research, you don't have the large scale randomized control trials or the large cohort studies that has esport players and non esport players, for example, that follow them over 10, 20 years. So what you have is actually a plethora, ooh, nice word, a plethora of, <laughs> a plethora of, cross-sectional type questionnaire type study, or then you may have some studies that do one esport uh, activity and then some kind of uh, outcome that's assessed with it. Um, so I think uh, you're right. Uh, this really does a disservice in some sense to the field because when we, uh, when we have these uh, quick cross-sectional studies, you're really not painting a full picture and uh, you know looking at determinants of, of uh, esport performance and determinants of esport athletes health uh, we're lo we're looking at years of development over time when we have a cross-sectional study it's a it's a snapshot in time that limits our uh, our uh, conclusions that we can make um, so I think the the other piece that hurts, I think the the research is the stereotypes that we have to deal with, and it is up to us uh, in the in the field, both on the research and the practice side, to really sit there and say, you know, the uh, I apologize for saying this, the the, the player in the basement somewhere with. Uh, an unhealthy diet and, and, and the soda, that's a stereotype. And just me saying here is pushing that stereotype again. So that is actually uh, not what we should be doing. Rather, we should be characterizing, assessing, and then making conclusion based on the evidence. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, I agree, I've written a publication on on technical uh, occupational safety. So what has the employer, what is, what does he need to do? True activity of the employee do not materialize. Um, and mm -hmm. then of course you have a huge difference between someone running around wearing a, a, a headset or like a virtual reality application um, versus someone sitting on a, on a computer, uh, on a personal computer. So. Thanks so much for shining some light on that as well. We have one more question in the chat. It's like an open question. Um, eShape is a research network, but could you tell us more about like, is it for profit or nonprofit? And what's the best way to directly interact with you and be part of the network? Um, the best way is you see it on the screen right there. Uh, contact us. Um, to get get involved, uh, we are non uh, we are nonprofit at this point. We actually are non non financed at this point. It is uh, it is purely right now a group of interested individuals that are interested in shaping some of this as it as it moves forward. Uh, like for example, I had uh, uh, a question I had for the first talk was: Are there uh, educational standards that could be in esport curricula, those kind of things, those kind of structures to develop. That is actually more on the practice side, but certain on the educational practice side. Um, we we are very motivated, and I get to advertise session 2.3 where we show some of our, the research that we're doing, uh, along with a couple of other groups there. Um, we are more than happy to chat with you, chat with your uh, colleagues and see where we can take this. Um, it is a, 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 we're very early, we, we're registered in Switzerland. 
So I think we're in some ways uh, a nice little complement to our German counterparts who are quite a bit farther ahead already. And uh, I think in that sense, maybe being uh, neutral uh, might uh, help us with international collaborators. Awesome. Unfunded. The cross that uh, most esports research must bear, I feel like. <laughs> so thanks so much. Best of luck to um, your network. And with that, we've already done it. Unbelievable how time flies when you have great speakers who bring you exciting insights. So I'm absolutely sure that the topics of player management and education will continue to be among the most important uh, areas of research in esports for years to come. Um, it was my pleasure and honor to be the host of this session. Uh, thanks to the great speakers, um, to the fantastic tech support. We got to mention them as well. Um, and of course, to the audience with all their great questions. So. Thanks so much, everyone, and best of fun in the next sessions. Goodbye. <laughs>